Women's Work is a special podcast production from Boise State Public Radio and the Mountain West News Bureau. And if you're liking this podcast so far, you might want to consider signing up for our weekly newsletter. You'll get sneak previews on upcoming episodes and behind-the-scenes photos and videos for my reporting. Head over to boisestatepublicradio.org slash newsletters. Heads up that there are a couple swears in this episode. This episode was recorded on the ancestral homelands of the Cheyenne, Arapaho, Ute, Apache, Comanche, Kiowa, Lakota, Pueblo, and Shoshone nations. In fact, 48 contemporary tribal nations are historically tied to the lands that comprise what is now called Colorado. They were forcibly removed, but their culture and ties to the land continue to survive and thrive to this day. Just drove past Fort Collins, Colorado. I'm on Highway 25, headed south along the front range of the Rockies toward Denver. And there is just housing development after housing development, cul-de-sac, gated communities, condominiums, subdivisions, all these new homes jammed in where there once were ranches and wild animals. More people are moving to rural areas across the West, and development is booming. It feels like every time I drive down the county road in the rural valley where I live in Washington, there's another pasture that's got a fancy new house being built right in the middle of it. I saw a bumper sticker not too long ago. It said, cows, not condos. Basically, getting at that dichotomy between developing land for homes or keeping it in ag and open space. Do you want more cows or more people? And I can't help but reflect on that as I'm driving down the Front Range to visit Adrian LaRue. She ranches right outside of Colorado Springs. Adrian's experienced the development boom in Colorado firsthand, and she's worried that we're losing productive agricultural land and replacing it with pavement and big houses. She wants to see that land stay open and undeveloped. And she's partnered with a somewhat surprising ally to do that. I'm Ashley Ahern, and this is Women's Work, stories about the changing face of ranching in the West. Adrian meets me in the driveway of the ranch, curly dark hair under a straw hat, a strong build, and a big, vibrant smile. I'm a hard-charging bitch. I'm... Most people who don't know me super well or like, wow, your energy is really intense. Um, But like with critters, I have so much compassion. People, I'm like very black and white. I've gotten better as I've aged. Adrienne grew up outside of Denver in the 80s and 90s. And over the course of her childhood, she watched the Front Range go from open country to sprawling development. She remembers traveling from her house in the suburbs to her grandparents' ranch in a more rural part of the Front Range as a kid. It felt like you had to travel, like, to the moon to get there because they were, like, so far away. Like, there was such a distinct line from, like, where our town or community or whatever ended, and then there was nothing, and then suddenly you were in their town. And now it's all blurry. It's just that development has filled in that entire gap along I-25. Adrian and her husband, Dan, started their company, Corner Post Meats, eight years ago in a remote part of Wyoming. They raise pigs and cows and sell their meat directly to customers. But after a few years of driving long distances to deliver meat to people in more urban centers, they realized they needed to be closer to civilization. So they moved here, to the Front Range, and now they're surrounded by all these ranchettes and subdivisions. But, like, the whole goal is how do we connect with these people? Hmm. So that, like, how do you appreciate agriculture because that is your open space? That is where you can see land management done well. That's where the wildflowers are blooming, or that's the open space, or that's the most beautiful part of my drive to work, is that it's not a bunch of houses. (laughs) For Adrian, it's not an either-or between new homes or livestock. We need more housing, especially affordable housing, across the West. 
But she says we need a patchwork of homes and open space, a local food system where people are closer to their meat. But not just any meat. It has to be meat raised in harmony with the surrounding environment, raised in a way that makes the ecosystem healthier, more resilient. That's where Adrian's pigs come in. The next morning, we get in her side by side and go out looking for them. If you're game with like packing around your stuff, we yeah. can go kind of wander around. Totally. Okay. We park in a stretch of the ranch that burned in a wildfire in 2013. I can't believe all these onions. That's insane. So it's crazy. The soil and lower parts of the tree trunks here are still black, like the fire left smudgy fingerprints where it went through. We start walking, and it's not hard to see that some kind of critter has been hanging out here. The dirt is all churned up around the base of the trees. I can't help but comment. It kind of looks like it's trashed. Right? So it's like you tilled your garden. Yeah. Um, but a pig nose did it. Okay. Sell me on this. So, okay. So, so if you look at like after a fire, a lot of times, um, there will either be like an ash crust, um, to where that, all those minerals like are just sitting on top of the ground. And so when you have a pig come in and do something like this, where they're rooting it around and they're moving it and whatever, like that's how they're now churning that into the ground. Um, in order to get like all of those awesome minerals from the fire into the soil. Adrian's crouched down in the duff, moving her hands around excitedly. All over my face now. Um, that's also she sees you know, her like, pigs as sort of a magical combo of rototiller and fertilizer all in one. But you might also add to that list pest controller. Mountain pine beetles have killed thousands of acres of trees across the West, turning forests into standing tinderboxes of fuel for more catastrophic wildfires. And what we have found with the pigs is that they love to eat that larva. And so, like, from that standpoint, they're literally, like, mitigating pest risk um, on trees. I checked this out with a couple of pig and bug experts. I wasn't able to find any hard science to back up Adrian's claim that her pigs eat pine beetle larvae specifically. But experts did say that's very likely the case. Pigs do love larvae, and they will definitely churn up crusty soil to mix in minerals, which could be beneficial after a fire. That said, pigs can also be very destructive to a landscape. They can completely uproot plants instead of just biting off the tops like cows do. They can also rip bark off trees, causing the trees to die. But the experts also told me that as in all things, it's about moderation. Too much piggy time is bad news for any landscape. And Adrian agrees. If you leave them here, then they will turn this into a parking lot. So it's all about timing. Just like many other animals on the land, it's all about the length of time. Both the time that they are there to kind of do their disturbing, you know, whether it's grazing, it's rooting, whatever, like that's all disturbance. Um, and then also your time to recover. I feel like we're getting warmer. <laughs> you don't have like a call for them or anything? Like come to me piggies? There we go. I probably could try one. See how embarrassing it is, whether or not it works. <laughs> there are supposedly 60 pigs in this pasture somewhere, but we have yet to spot a single one. Adrian's pigs spend their whole lives out on the land like this, moving from pasture to pasture across this 1,500-acre ranch so that they don't put too much stress on any one part of the landscape. That life is a stark contrast to the industrial pork farming model many of us have heard about. Hundreds and hundreds of animals crowded together with limited amounts of sunlight or fresh air, creating lagoons of waste. A pig raised in confinement on a big hog farm will spend 80% of its life lying down. But not Adrian's pigs. Right. These guys are like American Ninja Warriors. You know, like jumping over down trees and like doing all sorts of awesome shit. We get back in the four-wheeler and keep looking for them. So I said if we go out west, we can kind of look at the um, demonstration site. There are wildflowers blooming all around us. Paintbrush, penstemon, arrow leaf, flashes of color amidst the ponderosa pines. We get to the highest point on the ranch, and all around us 
I can see expensive looking houses tucked into the trees, lining the perimeter of the ranch. Pike's Peak is snowy and beautiful in the distance. This is a million dollar view, easy. And a lot of people would love to build houses here. Finally, we come over a rise and spot the pigs by their water trough in the shade of a bunch of pine trees. So they're all just napping. <laughs> I had never seen a real life pig pile, but that's exactly what it was. Dozens of piggies curled up together, just snoozing. Little ones, big mamas, they were all different colors, reds and browns and spotty. If you want to walk through, we can totally walk through them and they will all like jump up and run off like, huh, what, what is it? I was having a good dream. Oh, there we go. Oh, there we go. <laughs> A couple of them woke up and curiously came over to where I was crouched with my microphone. That's Ewok. Which one's Ewok? The like, mm. hairy one? Yes, the like bigger kind of crank. She's like one of the lead sow. Mm. Adrian's doing her best to use her animals to make this land healthier and raise good meat in the process. But there's not much she can do about all the land that's being developed around her. The changes worry Adrian, and she's not alone in her concerns about rapid development. This ranch where Adrian raises her pigs is actually owned by the Audubon Society. She leases it. Audubon, as you know, is a bird conservation organization. But in recent years, it has turned its attention to promoting more sustainable ranching practices and it started with this property. It's fucking hot. <laughs> Look at you. Good to see you. Good to see you too. Allison Holleran is the executive director of the Rocky Mountain branch of the Audubon Society. She met up with us at the ranch. Six years ago, Allison realized it was time for birders and ranchers to work together to help keep agricultural lands from being developed. Quite frankly, it, it comes down to habitat. Um, you know, if we don't have the habitat for birds, we're not going to have our birds. Habitat, just total loss and fragmentation, is the number one reason why we're losing bird species. And in this area, it's due to um, development. So Allison started the Conservation Ranching Program. This ranch, with Adrian running it, was the first to get certified. Ranchers can join the program if they agree to certain management practices that protect habitat for birds and make meat production more sustainable. So, for example, Adrian can't send her animals to feedlots or use pesticides or herbicides or cut hay when there are birds nesting on the ranch. And she has to work with the Audubon Society and an independent third party to develop a management plan and stick to it with annual bird counts to monitor her progress. In exchange, Adrian gets to put the Audubon bird-friendly seal of approval on her meat. It's sort of like the dolphin safe seal on canned tuna fish. It's branding that can help her get more money for her meat. Allison says the program's growing fast. We have over 100 ranchers in the program right now, over across 13 states, and um, just about 2 million acres enrolled. Privately owned ranches make up millions of acres of open, undeveloped land in the West. That could also be thought of as habitat worth protecting. That's a lot of land, that's a lot of bird habitat. The three of us get back in the four by four. All right, so I'm just gonna kind of like, we'll bebop around a little wider just to kind of give you um, what things look like and then hopefully catch a glimpse of the elk. Oh, cool. We roll through an open meadow surrounded by ponderosa pines. Allison's scanning the branches of the tall trees around us. Birds, like all of our hawks loved us because they could perch and then hunt out in the open. So all of their meals are out here and then, you know, their, their safety and their shelter and their nest can be in the trees. Since the Audubon Society took over this ranch, they've seen an increase in bird populations of all kinds. Goshawks came back. They're a rare kind of hawk that swoops through forests to hunt. 
They hadn't been seen on the property in years. Adrian turns the 4x4 toward home, and we're cruising through this shady stretch of forest. Allison's in the middle of telling me about the uptick in woodpeckers on the property. When I spot an elk in the distance. Yeah, yeah, she was lying down, looking at us. It's amazing, too, as we've seen the development happen around here, just the wildlife being pushed. Um, onto this place because they, you know, um, they, they have to have some place. Adrian cuts the engine. Maybe we'll just sit still for a minute. The three of us sit quietly and watch as six or seven female elk run through the trees ahead of us. They've come here to this last patch of open space amidst all the ranchettes and subdivisions to give birth. Another one just jumped up yeah. to the right. The Audubon Society didn't set out to make an elk refuge here. That happened almost accidentally. And sure, this is a sliver, a shadow of the original intact habitat that used to be here. Now, these elk and the birds and other creatures share this space with Adrian's pigs and cows. Maybe not ideal, but that's still a better option than sharing it with any more of us humans. Okay, I've got one more episode for you all. Thanks so much for listening along with me so far. If there's one thing I've heard in all the conversations I've had with women ranchers across the West, it's that running a ranch can be a lot of pressure. Yeah, so there was just a lot of kind of dark, lonely nights in my office looking at my budget thinking, I know I'm smart (laughs) and I can't figure out how to make it add up. Um, Am I going to be the generation that blows it? (laughs) That was what I would think over and over again. Corey Carmen is decidedly not blowing it. In fact, she's managed to build a more sustainable meat supply chain that's providing an alternative to the industrial meat system we have in this country. The question is always, <laughs> well, we can't feed the world doing it the way you're doing it, right? And my answer to that is, we actually can't feed the world the way that we're doing it right now. But what we suffer from is a failure to imagine it because all we can imagine is the system that we know. Reimagining our meat system together in our final episode. I hope you'll join me. Women's Work is edited by Whitney Henry Lester. Sound design is by Liza Yeager. Art for the series is by Katie Michael.